Hi, this is Phil Candreva from the Navy Postgraduate School. This video is designed to instruct you in an analytical method that's commonly used in law schools in America to analyze cases in, with questions of fiscal law. And we call it the FIREC structure, facts, issue, rule, analysis, conclusion. That's typically the structure of the write-up of your analysis. The process actually starts with understanding the rules, then understanding the facts, uncovering the legal issue in question, doing the analysis, and then reaching a conclusion. So I'm going to walk through a generic legal scenario with you, and then we'll uh, then look at a fiscal law scenario. Hi, this is Phil Candreva. This short video introduces the student to the FIRAC process. What is FIRAC? Well, it's a process for doing legal analysis. It's also the structure used to present that analysis in written form. FIRAC is an acronym that stands for Facts, Issue, Rule, Analysis, Conclusion. And that's typically the format that we want to use when we're writing up our analysis for consideration by a decision maker. The process is a little different though. We don't quite do it in those steps. The first thing we need to make sure we do is understand the legal rule that we are applying to this scenario. The second step then is to understand the scenario and to determine what are the legally relevant facts at play in this scenario. And we know what a legally relevant fact is if it is one that invokes or is related to some element of the rule. The next thing we need to do is to look at this intersection of facts and rules and identify what really is the issue here. The issue is not can I do it or is the person guilty of the crime. The issue is usually something much narrower than that and is dependent upon the specific scenario and the rules that are being applied. Then once we've isolated this issue, we want to analyze the scenario by thoroughly uh, comparing the facts to all of the elements in the rules. And this should lead us to a logical conclusion. So let's try it with a scenario. And this is a scenario I use with brand new law students. It's a pretty simple story of three people. We have David is walking down the street on a cold winter day and he sees his friend Peter walking down the street with another man named Sam who David doesn't know. David and Peter have a history of horseplay with one another and so their backs are turned to David. David reaches down to the ground, scoops up some snow, makes a snowball and throws it at Peter. The snowball instead hits Sam squarely in the back. Sam spins around and has an angry look on his face and he yells, what the heck? David then reloads, forms another snowball, and throws this second snowball at Peter. Peter now, having turned around, sees the snowball coming at him, raises his briefcase, and the snowball glances off of it. Peter recognizes David, laughs with delight, bends down, and starts to form his own snowball. And Sam, who doesn't want any part of this, steps aside and takes cover behind a parked car. So these are this is our scenario, our story. And the question is, did David batter Sam, and did David batter Peter? And the common law definition of a battery is here on the screen. It is an intentional act that causes a harmful or offensive touching of the person of another. So now we have a set of facts and we have a rule. Okay. So let's take think about this rule. And this rule has three elements to it. And what is an element? An element is something that needs to be proven in order for this rule to govern uh, what's going on. And then the question here that's governing is, do we charge David with battery? Right? And so the three elements are that one needs to have performed an intentional act. The second element is that act causes a harmful or offensive touching. And the third part is and that harmful or offensive touching has to be to the person of another. So you can't batter yourself, for instance, or you can't batter uh, an inanimate object. So with respect to Sam, we think about the facts. What are the legally relevant facts? Well, Sam and David didn't know one another. 
Another fact is David formed a snowball and threw it at Peter, but it hit Sam instead. And another relevant fact is that Sam has an angry look and he hides from the second snowball. So our legal issue here is not whether or not a battery occurred. That's sort of the ultimate question we want to ask. But the legal issue at the, at the center of these facts is whether or not David intended to hit Sam. Intent is the question here. Uh, so now we want to apply the facts to our, the three parts of our rule. So part one, did David perform an intentional act? Well, notice that intentional modifies the word act. It doesn't modify the outcome. It modifies simply the action. So was Sam's or David's act intentional? Did he intend to throw a snowball? Absolutely he intended to throw a snowball. Right? He deliberately formed it and aimed at Peter. He's just a bad aim. Right? But the act itself was intentional. Second part, was Sam harmed or offended? Well, what do we know from the facts? We know that Sam had an angry look on his face. We know he said, what the heck? And we know he hid from the snowball fight, implying that he did not want to be engaged in this. So I think it's logical to say that, that uh, Sam at least found this offensive. And lastly, did the snowball strike Sam? Yes, it hit Sam uh, squarely in the back, according to, uh, to the facts. So we would then reach a conclusion, are the three elements met? Did David perform an intentional act? Yes. Did it cause a harmful or offensive touching? Yes, we could say it was offensive. Uh, and did it touch another person? Yes, it touched Sam. So we could conclude that David battered Sam. Now the facts are a little bit different when we think about Peter. Here we have the same three elements, but the f legally relevant facts are different. David and Peter knew one another and they had a history of horseplay. David also threw two snowballs at Peter, and one of them glanced off his briefcase, and we know that Peter laughed and joined in the snowball fight. So here the legal issue is really whether or not the snowball actually struck Peter, because it glanced off his briefcase. You might also say a legal issue is whether or not Peter was harmed or offended. So question number one, was the act intentional? We already covered that with Sam, yes. David intended to throw the snowball. So was Peter harmed or offended? Well, Peter's reaction to the snowball was very different from Sam's. Sam was angry and took cover. Peter laughed with delight and joined in. So I think we could say that, that Peter was not offended. We also don't have any facts to show that, that Peter was harmed in any way. So it doesn't look like that second element is met. But we don't want to stop here and say we're done. We want to look at all three elements. So the third element is, did the snowball strike Peter? Well, the snowball glanced off his briefcase. So you might initially think, well, no, it didn't actually hit Peter. It hit his briefcase. But let's think about the, the goal of this rule, right? We don't want people to be battering one another uh, on the street. And so if we alter this facts a little bit and imagine that Peter is not a burly uh, adult male, but he's kind of a frail elderly person. Uh, and the snowball hit the briefcase squarely. You could imagine that a snowball hitting uh, an object someone's holding in their hands with some force could, particularly on a snowy, slippery sidewalk, knock somebody off balance. Um, they would certainly feel a jarring in their arms, uh, and it actually could harm them. So I think it would be logical to then say that that briefcase is an extension of Peter. And so, yes, indeed, the snowball did strike him. Uh, so we would conclude in this case there is not a battery, not because the snowball didn't strike Peter. There's not a battery because Peter was neither harmed nor offended. Uh, and it would you would just chalk this up to two buddies goofing around on the street. All right, now let's try it with a fiscal law scenario. The scenario is on your screen, but in short, we have a military base where the drinking water at the base is not potable. And as a result, the base commander had ordered that water cannot be used for consumption or for the cleaning of dishes. And under the service regulations, when there is this type of an emergency, the command is 
properly authorized to purchase bottled water until the drinking water supply is safe. Now this base operates 24 hours a day, 365, and some of the personnel work 12 hour shifts and cannot leave the work area. So there's a break room equipped with a sink, a microwave, a refrigerator, a toaster oven, and people prepare their meals there. And typically they would wash their dishes in the sink after eating. But while they have this water crisis, they can't do that. So the base commander would like to use appropriated funds to buy disposable paper plates and plastic silverware for the employees. And he came to you as his financial advisor to know whether or not the command's appropriated funds could be spent this way. So there are four rules that can help us with this scenario. Rule number one is about the appropriation that this commander has. And let's stipulate that the appropriation simply says it's available for all proper expenses for the operation of the command in support of its mission. Rule number two is, in general, appropriated funds are not proper expenses for things that are deemed personal expenses. So they're not the government's expense, they're an individual's expense, even if that individual is a government employee. Third rule, what are these employee personal expenses? Well, they're typically food and clothing, but there are some exceptions to that. And we have four exceptions here. Exception number one for food is if you're in an official travel status and you're getting per diem. Exception number two is there's no potable water and so bottled water is supplied. This is the authority under which the commander had bought the bottled water. C and D both relate to clothing, which is really not an issue here, except when that clothing is specified as necessary, such as a uniform or protective equipment. And the last rule is, if employees are not allowed to leave a work area to get something to eat, then you can use appropriated funds to purchase common food preparation appliances and utensils, such as the microwave oven, refrigerator, toaster oven that they have in their break room. Okay, so here's our set of rules. Now we want to go into that phase where we are trying to identify what is our legal issue. So we've got this world of proper expenses that the command is allowed to use its appropriated funds for. And we'll show that by saying anything in the green box is okay. Rule number two says employee personal expenses cannot be paid for with appropriated funds. So everything in that universe is in a red box but there are some exceptions for food and clothing, most of which is a personal expense. Occasionally it's a proper expense when they're in a travel status and those things we talked about on the last slide. And then rule number four said, it is a proper expense to buy some common food preparation equipment in those cases where people can't leave. So our legal issue then is disposable plates and utensils. What are they? And if you look at this diagram, they could be one of five different things. Three would be okay. Two would not be okay to use the appropriated funds. The three that would be okay is if we deemed these disposable plates and utensils as a proper expense to run the mission of the command. Or they would be okay under our food exception. Or they would be okay if we can make the argument it was common food preparation supplies. It would not be okay if these disposable plates and utensils are deemed a personal expense. So this was a real case. And it was based at uh, the Air Force Reserve Command uh, back in November of 2017. And previously, the Commerce Department had raised this question of disposable plates and plastic wear under slightly different circumstances. And the answer the uh, Comptroller General arrived at was no. You cannot use the appropriated funds on the grounds that, and you can see the extended quote here, the disposable plates and utensils were deemed a personal expense to be borne by the individual. 
This is not common food preparation equipment. It's going to be um, used once and then disposed of by a single employee. And so absent specific statutory authority that says this is okay, and we don't have any, we just have their general appropriation. And we can't show that buying disposable plates furthers the mission of the organization. Even though this would be beneficial to the employee, it is not sufficiently beneficial to the government to do this. And therefore they cannot use appropriated funds for such a purpose. So if we go back one slide, what the Comptroller General was saying was this red arrow is, uh, or maybe the one down here, it's a per personal expense, food related expense um, of the employee. It does not fall into the food ex exemption and it's not considered a common item. So this is an example of how we would isolate the issue and figure out how to apply this set of rules to this set of facts.